Hi everyone, and welcome to the Illustration Department Podcast. I am your host, Giuseppe Castellano. In this podcast, I talk to folks in illustration, animation, and other creative fields about their beginnings, their successes, and the bumps and bruises they've experienced along the way. In this episode, I talk to author and illustrator Stephen Croninger. Growing up in Orfield, Pennsylvania, Stephen did not want to be a garbage man like his father. So in 1979, he moved to New York City to be an illustrator. Among other topics, we talk about New York in the 1980s, when the Village of Voice is still around, and art directors wrote helpful rejection letters. Stephen explains how a boy from, quote, The Sticks got a one-person show at the MoMA, and he tells us why illustrators should always say they can, even if they can't. I hope you enjoy our conversation. What what year was it when you moved to New York? 79. And what was your first apartment? The first place I moved when I got off the Bieber bus uh, was at a a hotel, which I didn't know was like a hotel for prostitution. Uh, So I left there and then came down to the village and we just like went door to door. I moved there with a girlfriend and um, went door to door, like ringing people's buzzers and uh, asking if there was a place, any apartments available. So there was a woman getting her mail and we asked her like, are there any apartments available? And she said, well, I'm moving out in a month. So if you want to live with me and my boyfriend for a month in this very small room, it was really a compartment and it had had no kitchen and it had no, and the bathroom was in the hall, which she shared with 10 people. So we lived with them for a month and then they moved and we took over the lease. (laughs) <laughs> that was my first place in New York. Where was that? What neighborhood? It was um, at 10th and Hudson. And now are you sort of in that same area? Sort of. I mean, I live over by Washington Square Park now. Do you head over to Washington Square Park and hang out? Yeah, I go there all the time and read or just hang out. But um, yeah, I basically live on NYU campus. Living here, it's like I feel like I'm the only person aging. Everybody's 19 to 22. Sounds like a dystopian novel. <laughs> it feels like it sometimes. Where did you grow up, by the way? In Orfield, Pennsylvania. The Sticks. How were the Sticks? <laughs> well, there's a great line from um, Lou Reed in a song about Andy Warhol where he quotes Andy Warhol as saying, the best thing about growing up in a small town is you hate it and you know you got to get out. <laughs> Uh, were you always into drawing and painting? Like, how did you, when were you first sort of realizing like, oh, this is something that I should be doing? From when I was a little kid. I mean, I don't remember not drawing. Were you supported? My mother was interesting. My mother, uh, had a beautiful singing voice and she wanted to be a singer, but her parents completely dismissed her aspirations. So she, she, she kind of like put all that energy into me and she so she really encouraged me in getting me drawing lessons when I was a kid and she would always buy me supplies and she would buy me art books I would come home from school and there would be an art book lying on the bed you know Picasso or Van Gogh or something like that there was a W.C. Fields book on my bed with a note that said clean up your room my little (laughs) chick that's how it works but mostly they were art books I'm going to try that with my own kids. Right now, I just say, clean up your room, and, and I get uh, a 50% uh, success rate. I always thought the best uh, the best way to go with that is just close the door. I mean, I have two kids. <laughs> There's no point in telling them to clean up the room. Um, so what steered you toward collage? I mean, and, and let me preface that by saying, you know, when I think of illustration, when I think of illustrators who work in collage, and I don't know if that's exactly the appropriate term here, but I'll just I'll use it for now, and you can correct me. Uh, I think of folks like Eric Carle, of course, Leo Leone. I think of um, Esper Slobotkina, and uh, also Lois Ellert. What were some of your? I mean, are these some of the folks that uh, influenced you, or what were your influences? The Dadaists from Germany between the wars: George Gross, John Hartfield. And of course, I got into Romare Bearden and and of course, Matisse, Matisse like changes the whole landscape because Matisse's work wasn't um, predicated on the photographs. So it wasn't like you're just cutting up photos and piecing them together. His whole concept was that you're drawing with the scissors, just cutting into the color. And for me, that was a giant uh, revelation. How did you discover them? 
through school? No, I discovered it after school, after after moving to New York. All my friends like were drawing like pen and ink at the time and painting. Um, so um, I sort of have this attitude like if everybody's going in one direction, I like to go in the other direction. Um, so I was doing a piece for Stephen Heller, the, uh, the great uh, um, art director yeah. and historian, for a, an anti-nuclear war uh, show. And I was doing this giant, giant drawing, and it was looking like Ralph Steadman, and I was hating it. So eventually I just, um, I just cut up the photographs that I was using as reference and pasted them together, and then that became the collage. And um, I got a great response. So I guess I thought, hmm, maybe, <laughs> maybe this is the direction to go in. Okay, so before that, so let's backtrack a little bit. Uh, where did you go to school? I went to school in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. There's an art school there, right? Yeah, they have a they have a great art school there. Mm -hmm. And seriously, I went to college to get out of Orfield and to get to New York. I don't know if I could. I don't know if I could honestly say I went to college to get out of Baltimore. <laughs> well, but I, I could say that. I could say that. Yeah, I mean, my father was a garbage man, so and I worked on his truck with him, and I realized like I had these were my options. It was like you know, art <laughs> or the garbage truck. After school, I mean, were you able to get work before you graduated, or how did you get your? What was your first? Uh, I, I don't really like saying the big break, but what was your first big break? Well, backtracking a little bit is that I I, I, I used to do a lot of drawings for the school newspaper at Kutztown, and I, I sent a pile of drawings to George Del Marico at the Village Voice, and he sent me a note, and it said, you know. You know, you, these are OK, but, you know, you're not really ready yet. But if you come to the city, I'll be sure and look me up. So um, he was just being nice, which <laughs> I didn't quite realize. But I left school and I moved to New York. And then I called him up and I told him about his letter. And he was like, I what? Oh, um, <laughs> oh uh, yeah. Well, oh, OK, OK. Come and see me. So I did. And it's like I didn't expect you to show up at my door. Right. He didn't use me for a bunch of years, but I did my first collages for for him at The Voice. I remember him coming up to me. I did this collage of, of, of boxers and he came up to me and he said, uh, you're on your way. <laughs> and that was a proud moment. A lot of illustrators that I talked to today, they might be hearing that story and going, why aren't people doing that now? And that's something that just doesn't happen anymore. You reach out to folks and they don't write a letter back to you. They're, they don't open their doors to you or help you out or say something nice. Yeah, I was kind of at the tail end of that, where you could call up an art director and they would say, come on over and bring your work. And they would look at it and they would give you comments. Um, but yeah, of course, it's the internet. It's like everybody does everything now on, um, you know, through email and things or, you know, through their websites. And they don't really meet uh, art directors face to face, which is kind of sad because uh, also with, um, with that art director at The Voice, he didn't use me right away. And I would keep uh, sending him stuff. And I would keep calling him. Once I called him and said, you know, can we get together? Could I meet you, show you my work? And he was like, no, 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 no. Just drop it off, blah, blah, blah. And then I made some kind of a dumb joke. And he laughed. And he went, all right, come on over. <laughs> <laughs> then I started working for The Voice. My first work for The Voice were pen and ink drawings. And then I kind of slipped off into collage. How did you leverage that to expand your client base? How did you... Re re was it just a series of phone calls and letters and submissions or what? When, when I was in The Voice, everybody saw The Voice then. So um, from The Voice, I, I started working for The Progressive um, in Wisconsin. Uh, and then I started getting calls from The Times and from Esquire and from all these other magazines and stuff. And then from there, it just builds and builds and builds. But yeah, so it's just by being in The Voice because everybody, everybody looked at The Voice Every week, like every magazine, every newspaper, uh, art director. I always, I used to think of it as we were, we were the farm club. How did you feel when you heard that the voice was going down? For me, the voice kind of what, what the voice. I always tell people like when I worked for the voice, you had to pay for it, and I think it kind of started to lose its altitude when it when it went free, which is in the mid nineties, I think. Mm -hmm. So speaking of the mid '90s, how did the children's book industry find you? Uh, there was a show at the at the uh, at the library, I think, 
on garbage. <laughs> so I was kind of the perfect person for that. <laughs> and I did a, a little, a, like a little um, turn of the century garbage man, you know, with the white outfit and the and the can and the brush, like marching through the streets. And I did a little illustration for the New Yorker, and an editor from um, Simon and Schuster saw it, uh, Ann Schwartz, and she she said, you know, I think you can do a children's book, and that and she called me into our office and we did the first book. How did she contact you? Did you have a website at that point? No, no. She just called me up. Was it a challenge to, cause the, obviously the lead time for editorial versus lead time for children's books is, you know, it's night and day. Right. Were you, was one, uh, endeavor easier than the other? My basic attitude all throughout my, uh, my career has been that I'll, what, what, my always my thing is to never say no. If somebody calls you and says they want you to do something and it's something you've never done before, like animation, say, which I eventually did, and they say, um, you know, can you do this? And I've never done it. And I go like, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> my attitude is like, if you fail at it, they'll never call you again. But if you succeed and it works, then you have a whole new 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 you know way to go with your work. I don't know if that makes sense. It definitely <laughs> makes sense. Is that how you approach the animation job for Nickelodeon? Yeah. I mean, let me tell you that one is I got a call uh, to do these animations with this um, with this person who did uh, songs for children. And we were going to do little bumper songs. Uh, I was going to animate them. Or I was going to design the animation. The animation was done at Nickelodeon. And he said, you know what? I like what you're doing. I like that you're doing these collages where you're putting collage, but underneath you have these pencil drawings. I had no idea what he was talking about. I had no idea whose work he was seeing. But he said, can you do that for us? And I was like, yeah, I could do that. So I did. And again, they really liked them. And I ended up doing a lot of them for uh, for Nickelodeon. So they were like, it was like collage. And it looks really great. Which When I did them, I was like, wow, this is really nice. I don't know who came up with this, but it's really nice. But I didn't copy anybody because I didn't know who that person, I, I didn't know the work of that other person. And I, to this day, I don't, I've never seen it. Did that animation job lead to other animation jobs? I don't remember, but I ended up doing like coloring books, uh, a lot of children's stuff. I got a lot of children's work to do from, from those animations. You worked with Chris Rock. Yeah. How did that happen? <laughs> that happened because... Uh, I, I knew the producer on the Chris Rock show and this guy came into Chris Rock and pitched who was who an animator. He pitched this idea of um, doing an animation for Chris Rock. Uh, and he said, I'm going to do it in the style of Stephen Croninger. And my friend goes, well, I know him. <laughs> Why don't we just call him? And that's how I got that job. I remember when I was in school, we had a teacher. I don't remember who it was. And if I did, I wouldn't. I wouldn't name them. Anyway, we're in a class, we're seniors, and uh, we're talking about how to get jobs. And he said, well, one way you could do it is work like someone else. Work like someone who's in demand. Because A, that style is in demand. And B, that person will be busy. And so folks who can't get that person will find you. And all of us were nodding our heads and writing in our notebooks like, yeah, okay, that, that makes sense. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But I look back, I look back, you know, 20, 30 some years later, I look back on that comment and that piece of advice thinking, obviously, wow, that was crazy. Yeah, it's really the wrong way to go. Very much so. I mean, you're in the desert a bit when you go out on your own, but in the end, if it, you know, if you get out of the desert, it's, it's great. Right. But you don't copy anybody else. That's crazy. If, if it's all about just, you just need to make money then I guess that makes sense. But if it's about finding your voice and making your own mark, it's that's not the way to go. Speaking of making your own mark, as far as your process goes, and, and full disclosure here, when I was young, I thought I would be drawing and painting sort of classically, and, and then I discovered your work. This was mid-90s. And I saw what you were doing with collage, and I saw what what Romare Bearden was doing and, and obviously what uh, Eric Carl and Leo Leone were doing and thought, oh, you can just cut things up and piece them together and make <laughs> interesting shapes. And it was a different way of story, visual storytelling for me. It was just sort of this, it opened, it opened things up for me. It was a little bit of a sea change for me. Uh, so that's how I worked. And that's how I 
kind of still do a little bit. I, I piece things together now. It's a little bit more digitally than traditionally, but I don't flip through magazines for hours on end with an exacto knife going, that's the right hand. That's the right eye. So how, what is your process? I mean, what is, how is it like, do you sketch it out first? Or I imagine that sketching it out first might be a little challenging in, in some ways because you don't really know how things are going to shape up, so to speak, when you start cutting up, right? Yeah, I just make it up as I go along. I mean, for me, the great thing about collage and the difference between collage and drawing and painting is that it's just completely improvisational, at least for me. I just make, I don't do any, I really don't do do sketches. I just did a large piece on um, the Stonewall Inn and I did sketches of people that were there. But when I came to do the piece, I didn't do like a sketch of how the finished piece was going to look. I just made it up as I went along. When you cut up these shapes, what are some things that you're keeping in mind? That's a good question. Now I have to have a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to have a good answer. I just, I mean, like I said, I just make it up as I go along. I focus on, on the Stonewall piece. I just focused on each person. And just as I went along, I just sort of, you know, look for color um, more than uh, photographic images and just start cutting into it. And it's a lot of, I mean, in the end, you don't really see the process, but there's a lot, they change. I mean, the pieces completely change, which is another thing I love about collage is that, you know, you, you could just brush it away with your hand and start all over again, you know, or, or you can just pull this piece out and that doesn't work. And then you try something different. So sometimes they take a while to, uh, to find the right, the right look for, for the person or the right colors. Do you think at all or worry at all about copyright infringement? Well, the way I work, there isn't any copyright infringement. I don't use I don't use people's photographs. I mean, I do for political pieces, uh, where but I always get permit. I, I well, I don't get the permission, but the, the uh, publication I'm working for will say there's a, a photograph of uh, of uh, Donald Trump uh, head. They will get permission from the from the uh, from the from the photographer. But they do that mostly just as a courtesy because legally that's not required, at least not for political images. You're protected by the First Amendment when you do political art. Right. And I was always told, and my understanding of, of using photography in art is, is the sort of 10% rule. Don't use any, any more than 10% of a photograph. I've heard that, but I, I don't know if that really yeah. would help. Exactly. I, I imagine there there would be a judge, you know, you sit standing in front of a judge going, well, what about the 10% rule? And the judge just shaking their head. Like and that. there are also differences between fine art and illustration, um, where you can might be able to do something in fine art, but you will get sued uh, in illustration. But again, I don't really use, I never use, I, I, I mean, I wouldn't cut out a picture of a bicycle and then cut out a picture of a hamster and put the hamster on the bicycle. That's not the way I work. You know, I would make up my own bicycle and I would make up my own hamster. Right. It would be a construction. Every piece would be a construction. It's drawing, drawing, you know, just cutting up and drawing with scissors. Speaking of scissors, is that your process? Has that always been your process? Totally traditionally scissors and I don't know. Um... I work digitally. Most of my editorial work is uh, digital. But the work I do for myself or children's books or things like that are, are cutouts. It's a, they are really actually are very different processes. You were saying earlier that you work digitally now that you used to work more cut out. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a diff, it's a way, different way of thinking. Because we, when you work digitally, you have much more control over the images. Like you were saying, like you're looking for that right hand, right? So let's say that you, let, let's be literal in the right hand and say that, you know, you need a left hand, but you found this right hand that's perfect. Well, you can just flip it, you know, uh, digitally. But when you cut out, You'd have to cut out that hand, and then you'd have to rethink your composition to fit that hand that's going in the other direction. Right. And obviously, you can make that hand smaller or bigger. Also, exactly. And you can match colors. Like, um, you know, if you, have, if you have a hand that doesn't quite match the, the flesh of the, of the face, you can fix that. But in, uh, you know, when you cut out, it's a whole different thing. Is one better than the other? No, they're just different. Uh, we were talking about doing sketches. I do do sketches for editorial because I can conform uh, in, 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 in digital collages, I can conform the images to the, to the sketch. I can make it match perfectly. You understand what I mean? It's a, definitely. Uh, so collage is obviously a big part of what you do. It is yeah. what you do. I also draw a lot, but nobody yeah. ever sees them. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? 
because drawing to me is like calisthenics. It keeps me keeps keeps me loose. Because what can happen over time is that you get really tight, you know, doing collage. And I always try to keep it, try to go back to keeping it loose. Do you see collage? How, what's the health of collage in art right now, in commercial art anyway? There are some people doing some great work, um, certainly in children's books. And there's people doing it uh, in editorially as well. Mm-hmm. So I guess it's healthy. <laughs> You're working in you're working in editorial, you're working in animation, you're working in children's books. You're building this obvious body of work, earning awards through it. At what point does the Whitney call and the MoMA? What happened with MoMA was um, I had a piece in a show. Uh, it was called The Masters of Collage. I wasn't one of the masters. I was in the, the the masters were like Kurt Schwitters and Hannah Hawk and uh, John Hartfield. And then in the back where they cut the mats, they had some contemporary collages. And I was one of those on the wall. And a curator went to this show. It was just a small gallery uh, and saw my work and called me up and asked me if they could buy a piece for the collection. And I was like, sure, yeah, <laughs> so he came down to select something um, uh, for, the, you know, for the collection. But then he started laying my work all over the floor, and he just said, I think we have a show here. <laughs> and that's how that came about. To this day, do you know, is that the only one-person show at the MoMA for an illustrator? Yes. Yeah, there have been other illustrators who have been in group shows, but that's the only one person. Except sure. for. And it was part of the um, architecture and design uh, wing of, the, of MoMA. So they understood that collage is design. What was that like? You're at the MoMA. This is your show. Yeah, it was interesting. Uh, it was, it was, yeah, <laughs> I don't know what to say. At what, at what, how long did it take to go from the Sticks, Pennsylvania to one man show at the MoMA? Well, I left New York when I was 22 and that show was when I was 35. So that's the director trajectory. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't, and it was one of those things where it was, that was completely out of the blue and completely off any thought that I had ever had about my, about my work or my career that I would have a one man show at MoMA. And what about the Whitney? How did you get hooked up with them? That was animation and um, it was done by this place called Funny Garbage. We do a lot of things for um, the uh, Cartoon Network, I think. And they do a lot of animation. They do a lot of art things. And they were just doing this project for the Whitney. Uh, and they just asked me if I wanted to do an animation for them. And again, it's like, <laughs> yeah, okay. And that was actually, that was the first thing I'd done digitally as animation. And um, that was a nightmare because I was just learning how to do it. And I just, there were so many times where I would do something. And you, I'm sure you've had the same experience when you first started out on computer. And it just disappeared. You know, no longer. It's like I just did like hours and hours of work, and now it's gone. So that was how that went. But I finally, I finally, I finally finished it. My experience with digital work is, uh, if you're working on something and then you end up losing it, you spend two hours on it, and then you end up losing it after the four or five seconds of of, of cuss. Cu- cuss words. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I was gonna say them, but I'll, you know, let's just keep this. Uh, let's keep it PG. And I remember it takes a tenth of the time to redo everything that, you know, that I did. And you learn an important lesson. <laughs> do you build a library of imagery? For the most part, no. Because, again, like, I just like to make it up as I go along. And a lot of times, you know, you have an idea in your head, but you're flipping through images and you go like, oh, yeah. And then it, it takes you in a completely different direction than what you were thinking. I mean, one of the things years ago, I used to do stuff on my, um, well, I still do, <laughs> on my desk. There were cutouts, but it was I was in front of a window, and sometimes the wind would come in and it would blow my collage to pieces, and I would look at it and go like, "Man, that's more interesting than what I was doing," <laughs> and I would like you know, go with that. Oh yeah, that's happened with me. I've seen coffee stains on my table that are better uh, portraits of human beings than anything that I could put together. Yeah, yeah, and then you just think, yeah, okay, I can go with that. Yeah, you're like, damn, that's a good portrait. What keeps it interesting because you're always thinking. I mean, I think like, you know, my friends who do more traditional painting, they'll do, they'll do these really elaborate finished sketches and then they'll trans, translate that into paint. And I think, that's, you know, there's, I don't, I, it's just not the way I think. 
you know, they did these beautiful drawings, and you go, like, the drawings enough for me. <laughs> how long? How long have you been a professional, quote unquote, illustrator? Thirty years, twenty-five years, something like that. And you've managed to work in all types of industries, and you've shown at the MoMA, and, the, and you've had work. You know, you've done did an animation for the Whitney. And you've done all these things. You've, you're an award winner. Uh, you've been recognized by the Society of Illustrators. So all of this sounds lovely, but I suspect, and maybe not, I suspect that there have been some bumps along the way. Yeah, any bumps in my career, I, I pretty much were my own. You know, being uh, too too puffed up, too full of myself, I guess, and, and, you know, like, yeah, messing projects up or something. But that's happened infrequently, but the bumps were my own, my own doing. All right. So what's that lesson then? Stay out of your own way, <laughs> you know, as far as like, as far as work goes. That reminds me, I was reading an article about uh, Jim Henson and I read an interview from Frank Oz and he was asked, what is one of the things that you've learned from your friend Henson? Oz said, you know, without Henson, I would never have been a director and uh, I would never have been a puppeteer. I would have never done voiceovers. And one of the bigger lessons I learned from Henson, says Oz, is, especially as a director, keep your mouth shut and get out of your own way. Yeah, absolutely. So tying all of this together. Yes. What are some pieces of advice that you would share to il with illustrators working today, wanting to, and, you know, wanting to sort of get into whichever industry they want to get into, whether it's editorial or children's books or animation and, and, uh, obviously don't tell them to copy you. Uh, no. Yeah. I mean, they can, I, I'm, I'd be flattered. People have, <laughs> it's okay. I can read you the letter that the guy from the village voice sent me, which is hanging on my wall and has always been good advice. Go for it. Okay. Let me go get it. Okay, here's the letter. I uh, said, this stuff isn't for us. Not for, not yet, anyway. You are not without talent, though, by any means. Try to soak up as much drawing as your eyes can handle, and don't try to be commercial. Just draw. And then he wrote, I hope you come calling on me when you hit New York. <laughs> and then he put his phone number. I didn't realize that he didn't mean that. But, <laughs> but he was true to his word, and he saw me. That's That's excellent. And he was one of the first art directors to ever hire me. But not then. It was like two years later that he finally hired me. To me, that's still the best advice that I ever got as far as illustration goes or that I could even give. You know, just, just draw. Just do your work. You know, just, just keep at it. To learn more about Stephen, visit stephenkroeninger.net. If you enjoyed our conversation, please share it online. Subscribe to the podcast and leave us a positive rating and review. This helps us find new listeners, and, on a personal note, it would be nice to know that the podcast is helping. Continue the conversation in the comments section of each episode at illustrationdepartment.com forward slash podcast. This podcast is produced by the Illustration Department, a global leader in online education for illustrators. Visit us at illustrationdept.com for class offerings, testimonials, the Alumni Showcase, and more. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.